Good morning. If you'd like to turn to 1 Kings chapter 11, page 349, page 349, 1 Kings chapter 11, and I'm going to preach and comment, etc. So that's what we're going to do this morning. So I hope you're well and uh, you're ready to hear God's word as he speaks to us. 1 Kings chapter 11, page 349, and the first 14, 13 verses. Let me begin with some questions. Can Christians stray from God? Yes, they can. Can Christians ruin their lives by sin? Sadly, yes. Can Christians lose their first love? Yes, they can. Solomon. Solomon is an enigma. He's a mystery. After Solomon dies, he is spoken of as a good example alongside David. In 2 Chronicles 11:17, we read, Those from every tribe of Israel who set their hearts on seeking the Lord followed the Levites to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices to the Lord following the ways of David and Solomon. A good example, like David. But then... The preacher Nehemiah in 500 BC used Solomon as a warning example. Nehemiah 13 verse 26. Nehemiah preaches to the people. Among the many nations there was no king like Solomon. Solomon was loved by his God. God made him king over all Israel but even he was led into sin by pagan women. Good example, bad example. Christians. Solomon is a warning to us. I don't know whether you set timers for things. We use them. We've got two at least. We set off loads of timers and then they suddenly go off and you think, what was that for? I always set a timer for my tea, four minutes or five minutes to make sure it's strong. But you set off timers, don't they? Warning. Well, the Bible sets timers for us. These Old Testament stories, written as examples, were told in 1 Corinthians 10, 6. And the book of Hebrews echoes with this warning. Hebrews 2, 1. We must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. This passage this morning is a timer for me. Don't drift God wants to keep me and you truly, fully devoted to him. Don't lose your first love. Solomon is a great lesson for us. So first of all, let's look at 1 to 8. Solomon's heart strays. Solomon's heart strays. What causes Solomon to stray? We're going to have a look, but just let me make this point. First, Solomon's sin is an idolatry sin. That's the sin that leads him astray. It's an other God's problem. On first reading, you think it's a lust sin. And I think, yes, yeah, sexual sin is part of the problem. Verse 1 suggests it. Let me begin. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians and Hittites. He was ruled by love. He loved them. It says in two, he held fast to them in love. He was ruled by love. Some marriages could have been for political reasons, but it does say that he loved them. Love is a powerful emotion, one that must be carefully guarded. The history of politics, the history of the world, the history of royalty, Edward and Mrs Simpson, uh, I've been doing royalty in my, uh, my exercise. How many of those royals love just ruled them? The history of churches, Christians, gives us story after story where the power of loving desire has led many to their ruin. I think he was ruled by lust, the desire for forbidden fruit. We, we see here male dominance of females, don't we, using them? Solomon knew very well God's freeing law on sexual conduct. He wrote Proverbs 5. 
but he gets the number and the type wrong, doesn't he? Number, too many wives, and type, the wrong ones. He didn't go for godly ones. Sexual pleasure, Solomon knew, sexual pleasure is only for marriage. And marriage is for one man and one woman, exclusive, for life, and only marry a fellow worshipper of the Lord. But let's listen to the text. Having more than one wife was always sin, but it seems that the text is saying more. It was the religion that his wives had that is noted. Verse 2. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them, because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Solomon knew Deuteronomy 7. It was in his Bible readings. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, Deuteronomy 7, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods and the Lord's anger will burn against you. Or Exodus 34, Solomon knew. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land. When you choose some of their daughters as wives for your sons, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your sons to do the same. Solomon knew that marrying non-Israelite wives would lead him astray. And God said it would happen, and it did. Let me read 3 through 8. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely, as David, his father, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. So it is a seventh commandment sin, adultery, but chiefly it's a first commandment sin. You shall have no other gods before me. Or a 1 John 5, 21 sin. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols or keep from away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. It was the way his unbelieving wives led him into idolatry that was the chief sin. For us, uh, other gods that we're tempted to follow are not statues or temples. It's anything or anyone that your heart relies on to give you meaning or purpose. The prophet Ezekiel said about people in his day, these men have set up their idols in their hearts. God says the human heart takes good things, like a job that we love, or like love itself, or material stuff, or family, and turns those good things into ultimate things. Our hearts deify those things as the core, the centre of our lives, because we think that these things can give us significance, security, safety, satisfaction, if we have them. For you, it might be a person, it could be sport, it could be cooking, it could be family, it could be health, it could be hobby, career, job. Who gives you your identity? Your God is, if it was taken away from you, life would be almost not worth living. Don't be enticed. Well, we can see now for ourselves that it's his heart that strays. Okay, it's his heart that strays. Solomon's heart that strays. Notice it's his inner life. It's a great question. How is your inner life? You know, the core of you that no one sees. 
Here, heart. It's the Hebrew word levav, and in verse 2, they will turn your hearts after their gods. In verse 3, the NIV just translates it, led him, but it's his wives led his heart astray. In verse 4, the word heart comes up three times. His wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart wasn't fully devoted to the Lord, as the heart of David his father had been. Heart, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is not we might not what we might think. Now, it's obviously not that organ uh, that's beating in your heart, in your chest. And it's not like this. Uh, I heard of a film where the barrister says to the jury, don't decide with your minds, but decide with your hearts. I.e. go with your feelings, but not your thinking. That is not the meaning of heart in the Bible. Quote, the Bible has a bigger heart. You see, the heart, levav in Hebrew, is the centre of a person. It's the centre, the core that wills and decides and loves and thinks. The Bible, you see, doesn't separate head or mind and heart. Rather, for the Bible, the head is in the heart. So you see, the repetition, the obsession with heart in verses 2, 3 and 4 tells us that we're dealing with the invisible, the inner core of Solomon. Jesus knew it. It is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Theft, murder, adultery, sexual impurity, malice, deceit, lewdness, etc., arrogance. All these evils come from inside. Solomon knew it. Proverbs 4 that he wrote, guard your heart, your core, above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The book of Hebrews reminds us that our hearts can subtly harden. A Christian's heart can shrivel, can go astray, and it's invisible. How is your heart? How's my heart? Am I soft to God? Fully devoted to God? Solomon's heart gradually strayed. Notice it's gradual, verse 4. As Solomon grew old. It's not a sudden attack. It's not a sudden straying. It's kind of different to David's sudden sin. You know, on the rooftop and then uh, in the bedchamber with Bathsheba, that was a sudden attack, wasn't it? Here for Solomon, it just gradually happened. His heart, as he grew old, was led astray into idolatry, into lacking devotion to God. My, uh, my lenses of my glasses, not these new ones actually, my old ones would, off, would sometimes pop out. And that didn't just happen, it was because the screws just gradually loosened over time. In lockdown I gradually lost my hearing, well it's back again now, I gradually lose my hearing, it's the oh, stuff in my ear. Just a gradual, gradual heart stray. Last year, sadly, and we're just hearing about it now, a famous Christian leader died. After his death, there has been clear evidence that has emerged of years of sexual sin, of abuse of women. We first of all feel there, but for the grace of God go I. But how did it happen? Quote, the creeping pace of accumulated compromises. Your heart straying is gradual and subtle, isn't it? And it's not just lust. Mature Christians can gradually, in middle to older age, grow bitter and proud and nitpicky and know all. Uh, just look in the mirror, Nigel. The subtlety of sin, gradual, must frighten us. Solomon's story must frighten us. Pray for ourselves. The Lord's Prayer, lead me not, Lord, into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. I pray for my children. They are, by God's grace, baptised, belonging believers, but they're never safe. We pray for them. I should do more. I pray for you older believers. Lord, keep us all from sins that so easily entangle. Our Solomon's heart strays. And just notice the tragedy 
still under this first heading, it's a tragedy when a heart strays. We've seen in 1 Kings the rising and shining of Solomon. Now it's the declining from 11 onwards. It all began so well. 30 years earlier, it was recorded in chapter 3, Solomon loved Yahweh. Now it is recorded in 11.1, Solomon loved many, a thousand, pagan, idol-worshipping women. Solomon had built with great intention. He built a holy, pure temple for the holy, pure Lord. And now, in 5 to 8, Solomon builds cosy chapels, quote, for his pagan wives so they can carry on their detestable, damned, burning perfume and sacrifices to detestable, evil gods. And though the text doesn't say it, the mood, the hint might well be of terrible sacrifices, horrible things going on in Jerusalem where the pure golden temple of God was, but Solomon had now built these wicked, depraved, dark, pagan temples to wicked, horrible gods. Once he was known as Solomon the Wise, now he's Solomon the Fool. Solomon's affections, his loves, gradually changed. Perhaps he he just didn't believe the scriptural warnings. You know, it, it can never happen to me. I can handle it. It will never happen to me. Nehemiah uses Solomon in a text I only just discovered last week from uh, William Hendrickson, I think it was. Nehemiah preaches to people 400 years after and he takes this narrative and he says to the people there, wasn't it because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like Solomon. He was loved by his God and God made him king over all Israel. But even he, even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? Nehemiah 13. Isn't it this a tragedy? So I ask myself and you ask yourself. Where are my affections lying this morning? In lust? Or in some good gifts, money, power, lifestyle? What is your love, family? Am I headed for tragedy because my first love has gone? It is intriguing that Solomon didn't officially give up on the Lord his heart just wasn't fully devoted to the Lord his God. And that's maybe some of us. Verse 6. He, he did not follow the Lord completely. Maybe that word completely strikes a note with you at the moment. These are serious questions for me, for me, and for you, for us all. However young or old along you've been a Christian. So what happens when we stray, when we compromise with other gods? We've seen Solomon's heart strays. Very quickly, the Lord's heart stays. I want you to notice in 9 through 13 that the Lord never strays from his straying children. Solomon was, quote, Nehemiah 13, loved by his God. And the Lord's three responses are those of love. In 9, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. What grace! Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So notice here the Lord's heart now, the anger of the Lord. This is God's wondrous anger against his children when we stray. God will never stop loving us, but he can be wondrously angry with us. God's anger, you see, flows out of his jealousy for top place in our hearts. Exodus 34, do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
Quote, Jealousy is simply the character of any love that is worth its salt when that love has an exclusive claim. I loved my children, uh, still do, but when they were younger, I was wondrously angry when my dear children disobeyed and when they rejected my grace. The anger of the Lord and then the chastisement of the Lord, verse 11. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Now we're going to see how that is worked out in the next verses in the next couple of weeks. But just this chastisement of the Lord. God takes away Solomon's privileges or some of them. Taking away of privileges is used by our parents when they are wondrously angry with us. You know, no Xbox for a week or no phone for a month. Sin has consequences. Chastisement is to teach us, to teach Solomon, how bad sin is, how dangerous sin is, to correct us. And then finally, the rays of hope, and more of this next week, 12 and 13, the rays of hope, the grace of God. Nevertheless, God says, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. The grace of God, the rays of hope. Here we see the saving promise plan of God, which cannot be stopped. The remnant and more of this in the next few weeks. Well, this is about the kind of heart that God desires the heart of Solomon that sadly strayed and God's response to it. Jesus asks me and you this morning and he says to me, Nigel, do you love me? Nigel, do you love me? The third time, do you love me? Put your name in there. Will I respond? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. This week, I want you as number one. I have no rival gods. Please reign supreme in my life. And in the language of Solomon's prayer words that he uttered in 1 Kings 8, 58, Lord, incline my heart to yourself to walk in all your ways, to keep your commands and statutes and judgments. I just want to be wholly devoted to you. I want to follow you completely. May Solomon be a lesson for us, a warning for us.